Hello, I'm Charlie Thompson, and this is the Chapter 4 lecture, or at least the first part of the Chapter 4 lecture. I'm going to break this up into two videos. Uh, the first video, we're going to cover the first half of the chapter. The second video, we'll cover the second half of the chapter. So the chapter is Atmospheric Water and Weather, and really the whole key to this chapter is going to be atmospheric water. That's the stuff that is either a gas or liquid or a solid, so it's falling as rain or snow. It's creating storms. It's all That's all going to be water in the atmosphere. I realized that weather is a good title for this chapter. No, atmospheric water and weather, that totally works, because when we're talking about weather, there's wind, but the wind kind of just blows the rain around. So really, when we're talking about weather... There's temperature, there's air pressure, there's wind speed, there's wind direction, there's cloud cover, but really one of the super important parts for everybody all over the world is, is it going to rain? And when and how much? So the whole key to this chapter is understanding water, which is really weird, like incredibly weird. Like you have no idea how weird water really is. Anyway, uh, in today's video, we'll talk about water's unique properties, humidity, atmospheric stability, and then clouds and fog. And then everything else we'll talk about in the second video. So big concepts for chapter four. How does water behave in the atmosphere? It absorbs heat. It releases heat. It melts. It freezes. It evaporates. It condenses. What are the forces that produce weather? Well, the most important force is going to be the latent heat of condensation. That's the heat energy that's released when water vapor condenses. It's, I think, the trickiest concept in this chapter but it's also, unfortunately, the key to the chapter. For example, what causes violent storms like thunderstorms and tornadoes and hurricanes? And the answer is the latent heat of condensation. So everything's just going to come back to the answer is, well, it's probably the latent heat of condensation. So water's unique properties. It is the most common compound on Earth. It has the highest specific heat of common substances. Remember, specific heat is the amount of heat required to change the temperature of a substance, which is a weird idea itself. But different amounts of heat are required to change the temperatures of different substances. And water has one of the highest specific heats on Earth. That explains things like land-water heating differences and continentality in temperature ranges. Remember, a calorie is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one Celsius degree. That's one calorie. Rock has a specific heat of like a quarter of a calorie. So it takes four times as much heat energy to change the temperature of water. Water is the most corrosive compound on Earth. I think it dissolves 57, 58 of the known elements. It dissolves more elements than anything else on Earth. It's the only substance that occurs as a solid and a liquid and a gas. So that's weird. Like rock, we have liquid rock in the form of magma and lava. We have solid rock, but we don't really experience rock as a gas. But water we have as a solid and a liquid and a, and a gas. It's the only substance that expands when it freezes. When water freezes, it expands up to 9% of its volume. Everything else on the planet when it freezes gets smaller. So if ice behaves like every other substance on the planet, ice, when it freezes, should get smaller, which would make it more dense, so it should sink to the bottom of your glass. Icebergs should be on the bottom of the ocean. Ice cubes should be at the bottom of your glass, except water is weird. So phase change is when water changes from one state to another. Latent heat is the heat energy that's absorbed or released during phase changes. So we've talked about latent heat before, we've talked about phase changes before, but they're going to be so important in this chapter because it's all about water. So time for vocabulary words. When uh, water as a gas, gas, water exists as a gas in the atmosphere, just like oxygen, just like nitrogen, just like argon, it's a gas, which is also weird. When a gas condenses, it becomes a liquid. When a liquid evaporates, it becomes a gas. When liquid freezes, it becomes a solid. When a solid melts, it becomes a liquid. You're probably familiar with those, but water also goes right from a solid. It sublimates and becomes a gas, and that gas can deposit and become a solid. 
Now, dry ice is probably the substance you're most familiar with that'll do this. If you've had a chunk of dry ice on a table, it sublimates. It goes right from a solid, doesn't melt, it goes right from a solid to a gas. There's no puddle of liquid carbon dioxide. It just goes right from a solid to a gas. And then inside your freezer, if you've ever seen frost inside your freezer, or maybe inside a plastic bag with food in it in your freezer, that happens when water vapor deposits and becomes a solid. And you get those ice crystals forming as the water goes right from being a gas to a solid. So some important ideas about latent heat. For ice to melt, it has to absorb heat. That's why it goes from a solid to a liquid because it's absorbed heat, so the molecules are more excited. That's an example of latent heat. So that's, uh, we'll talk about this in a minute, but that's 80 calories to melt a gram of ice. Now you can't, ice, ice gets up to zero, and as you keep adding heat, nothing is gonna happen, and then it'll melt, but the temperature won't change. Once you have liquid water, if you keep adding heat, then the temperature will change until it gets to 100 Celsius, which is as hot as you can get liquid water. As you keep adding heat, nothing will happen, and then it'll evaporate, and it'll still be 100 Celsius. And that's a phase change. That'll take 540 calories. So when ice melts, it absorbs heat. That heat is stored in the water. When water vapor evapor, or rather when liquid water evaporates, it absorbs heat. The heat is stored in the water vapor. Well, then when, yeah, ice to water, heat is absorbed. Water, water to gas, heat is absorbed. But then when water vapor condenses, it releases that heat. Gas to liquid, heat is released to the atmosphere. The heat that was keeping it a vapor, a gas, that heat is released and it becomes a liquid. If you keep, if heat is continually released, the temperature will change until it gets down to zero. As heat is released from the water, it'll eventually freeze, but the temperature won't change because it's a phase change. And then once it's ice, if, if it keeps releasing heat, the temperature will change. So it's like the temperature changes until there's a phase change, and then it goes from being a solid to a liquid. And then the temperature changes until there's a phase change and it goes from a liquid to a gas or vice versa. But solid, liquid, solid, liquid, liquid, gas, those are phase changes where the temperature doesn't change, but an enormous amount of heat when it, when water vapor condenses, it releases heat. When liquid water freezes, it releases heat. So ice absorbs 80 calories of heat and you have water at the same temperature. Water absorbs 540 calories of heat and then you have water vapor at the same temperature because that's a phase change. That's a phase change. Ice at zero degrees absorbs 80 calories and you get water at zero degrees. Water at 100 Celsius plus 540 calories of heat. When it absorbs that heat, you'll have water vapor at 100 Celsius. When water vapor at 100 Celsius releases 540 calories, it condenses and you get water because that's a phase change. When water at zero degrees releases 80 calories of heat, you get ice because again, that's a phase change. So here's the diagram from the book uh, listing the latent heat of melting and freezing, the latent heat of evaporation and the latent heat of condensation. Water's unique, yeah, it's weird. Next, humidity, which is water vapor in the atmosphere. The amount of water vapor you can have is just a function of temperature. The higher the temperature, the more energy is available to evaporate water. Okay, there's a couple ways we're going to measure the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. One of them is specific humidity. Specific humidity is one of the ways we measure how much water vapor is in the atmosphere. Specific humidity is the mass of water vapor per mass of air. So it's grams of water vapor per kilograms of air. And it just tells you how much is present. A kilogram of air is about a cubic meter. So if you had a blob of air that was three feet by three feet by three feet, it would weigh about a kilogram. This chart is maximum specific humidity. 
maximum specific humidity is the most amount of water vapor you could have at any temperature. So as you can see, maximum specific humidity is a function of temperature. This is the max. It doesn't mean you have it. It just means there's that much energy. So every time the temperature increases by 10 Celsius degrees, the maximum just about doubles. At zero degrees, the maximum is four grams. If it gets warmer by 10 degrees, there's enough energy to evaporate eight grams, go up another 10 degrees. There's enough energy to keep 15, 27, finally 47 grams, which is just shy of two ounces. So at 40 degrees Celsius, you could the maximum is 47 grams of water vapor. So this is one way of measuring measuring or expressing how much water vapor is present. And this is specific humidity. And again, it's just how much you have. Okay, this is another way of expressing or measuring water vapor. This is called saturation vapor pressure. So this is a really weird idea. Uh, it's the idea that water vapor is a gas, which you all know. And you could measure how much water vapor is present by looking at the vapor pressure. So the Another way of thinking, how much of the atmosphere is water vapor? Or how much of the atmospheric pressure, so out of 1,013 millibars of pressure, how much of that is water vapor? So at 20 degrees, the most you could have is 24 millibars, which you remember from air pressure. So 24 millibars of water vapor is the most water vapor you could have if you're looking at it in terms of saturation vapor pressure. It's interesting that the relative humidity over ice is lower than the relative humidity over water, even at the same temperature. So what that means is you'll have condensation over ice or sublimation onto ice before you get condensation onto water. And that'll be important when we talk about a couple, well, hole punch clouds, a very special, a very special kind of cloud. So relative humidity is how much water vapor is present compared to how much you can have. How much you can have, you just look it up on the chart based on the temperature, the maximum chart to tell you, well, if it's this temperature, this is how much you can have. But relative is how much do you have compared to how much you could have. Now, amount present, how much you have, amount possible is just a function of temperature. If the relative humidity is 100%, we say the air is saturated. There's no more energy to evaporate water. Any addition of water or cooling of the air means that some of that water will condense. So let's say it's five o'clock in the morning, it's zero degrees Celsius. We have, we measure it, there are four grams of water vapor. At zero degrees, the most you can have is four grams. So the relative humidity is 100%. And this next part explains why weather forecasters tell us what the relative humidity is because it determines our comfort. If it's too humid, we feel sweaty. If it's too dry, we feel dry. So, but however, weather forecasters don't really pay attention to relative humidity because in these three temperature humidity combos, the specific humidity, which is how much you have, maximum specific humidity is how much you could have. Specific humidity is just how much you have. So the specific humidity changes, or I'm sorry, the specific humidity stays the same. The specific humidity stays the same, but the maximum increases as the temperature increases. Remember, every time the temperature gets warmer by 10 degrees, the maximum just about doubles. So going from zero degrees to 10 degrees, the maximum is now eight. So we have four, the max is eight, so the air is 50% relative humidity. If it gets warmer by another 10 degrees, the maximum is now going to be 16. We still have four. The max is 16, so the relative humidity has dropped to 25%. So the specific humidity didn't change. What changed was the temperature and therefore the maximum. So as the temperature goes up, relative humidity goes down. As the temperature goes down, relative humidity goes up. So for example, if let's say in the afternoon sometime, another gram of water vapor evaporated off of a lawn. If in the morning it cools down to zero degrees again, if there were five grams, now the max is four, so an entire gram of water is gonna condense and make dew, usually at the coldest part of the day. 
which is what this is showing. This is a temperature on the top and hu relative humidity plot from the Sacramento airport. You can see as the temperature goes up, the relative humidity goes down. It would be interesting to look at what the specific humidity was across the day, because I'll bet it didn't change. Unless a new air mass moves in, the specific humidity probably won't change a whole lot during the day. But as it gets hot, the relative humidity goes down, and then as it cools off, the relative humidity goes up, because as the temperature goes up, temperature goes up, so does the maximum specific humidity. As the temperature goes down, so does the maximum specific humidity. Dew point temperature is the temperature at which the relative humidity is 100%. Or, dew point temperature is the temperature at which you begin to get condensation. So the dew point temperature is the temperature when the relative humidity is 100%. If it's below zero, it's called the frost point. Uh, yeah, dew point temperature, you get dew. This is a figure showing May 2009 actual precipitable water. How much water vapor was present in the atmosphere? You can see 70 millimeters over the tropics and close to zero over the places where it's colder. So the warmer it is in the tropics, the tropics are warm. There's lots of energy to evaporate water, so they have more water vapor in the atmosphere. And it's another, another diagram showing temperature and specific humidity. So you can see the warmer temperature regions have higher specific humidities, the colder regions have lower specific humidities. And these are specific, not maximum. These are actual just specific, it's what we have, specific humidity. Oh yeah, there's a couple fun, fun instruments used to measure relative humidity. This is called a sling psychrometer. It's a, a double thermometer. It has one thermometer with a cotton wick, like shoelace, that you get wet. That's called the wet bulb. And the other one is dry. It's called the dry bulb. So it's on a handle, and you spin it around. And as you spin it around, as long as the relative humidity is under 100%, water evaporates off the wick. As water evaporates, it cools that thermometer. So the more water evaporates, the more, this, the, more the wet bulb temperature drops. And then there's a chart, you look it up on a chart, you see what the dry bulb is, and then the difference between the dry bulb and the wet bulb is called the wet bulb depression. The more water evaporates, the drier it is. The more water evaporates, the drier it is, the bigger the difference in temperature. If there's no difference in temperature, that tells you the relative humidity is 100%. If there's no energy to evaporate water, then nothing is going to evaporate. The wet bulb is going to be the same temperature as the dry bulb. So if the temperatures are the same, you're at 100% relative humidity. If there's a really big difference between the wet bulb and the dry bulb temperature, then it's very, very dry. The relative humidity is low. And that's called a sling psychrometer. There's another device called a hair hygrometer. And they actually use human hair because as, as your hair absorbs moisture, it contracts and gets curlier. And so they've built these instruments, whereas the hair contracts, it pulls on the needle and changes the humidity reading on the dial. Kind of crazy that the two scientific instruments used to measure humidity, one of them involves a wet shoelace and the other one, uh, human hair. That's it for humidity. Let's talk about atmospheric stability. So stability is the tendency of an air parcel and when I say air parcel, what I mean is a cloud-sized bubble of air. So really, this is a good example of what I was talking about with systems. That like when you're looking in the atmosphere, when you look in the sky, there aren't dividing boundaries between things. It's like a cloud isn't separate from the rest of the sky. But if we want to talk about what's going on with that cloud, we're going to call it an air parcel. So air parcel, it's just an idea, although you can see clouds, right? And you can see on a day with little puffy clouds, each of those you could consider an individual air parcel. So when we talk about stability, we're talking about cloud-sized blobs of air. So air parcel, a cloud-sized blob of air. And stability is whether that parcel is going to rise or not. If the parcel is warmer than the air around it, it'll rise on its own like a hot air balloon. And we say it's unstable. 
if the parcel is the same temperature or colder, it either it, it's not going to rise if it's the same temperature. If it's colder, it'll actually sink, and we say the atmosphere is stable. Hot air balloons. I yeah, you just got to think about hot air balloons. A hot air balloon rises because it's warmer than the air around it. That's an example of an unstable parcel of air. If <laughs> if a hot air balloon was colder than the air around it, it wouldn't rise. Nobody would go hot air ballooning. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say, and the reason we care. I said it before in the intro, it's got to be in my notes someplace. If you want to make it rain, you need to lift air up. Or actually, yeah, that's the short version. I'll say it again because it's true. If you want to make it rain, you need to lift air up. So the longer version of that is, if you want to make it rain, you need to cool air. You need to cool air to dew point temperature. And pretty much the only way to cool air is to lift it up because as air rises, it expands and cools. So if you want to make it rain, you need to lift air up. And one of, ways, one of the ways that happens is unstable conditions where the parcel of air is actually warmer than the air around it, so it's just going to rise. So there are different rates of cooling and warming. There's different rates depending on if the parcels are moving or if we're talking about the atmosphere. So lapse rates. As you get away from the surface, Typically, the atmosphere cools off at the rate of 6.4 degrees. So the normal lapse rate, 6.4 Celsius degrees of cooling for every thousand meters you get away from the surface. The troposphere is heated by the sun shining on the surface. The surface is warm. So as you get away from the surface, the temperature of the atmosphere cools off. The air isn't moving. It's you that are moving as you go up through the atmosphere. So if you measure the temperatures, you got away from the surface of the Earth, the average rate of cooling is the normal lapse rate, that's 6.4 Celsius degrees. The environmental lapse rate is whatever it actually is. It's the actual rate of cooling at a given place at a given time. And that can be zero, it could be 10, it could be 12, but the average, the average then, just to reiterate, is 6.4. That's the normal lapse rate, 6.4 Celsius degrees per kilometer. So that's the rate of cooling of the unmoving atmosphere, and those are called lapse rates. So we've got the normal lapse rate and the environmental lapse rate. Uh, for test questions, I would always have to tell you what the environmental lapse rate is. So if we're talking about the unmoving lap atmosphere, we're talking about lapse rates. 6.4, the environmental lapse rate. If we're talking about a moving parcel of air, moving parcels of air heat and cool at adiabatic rates. And adiabatic means it's cooling or warming without sharing, gaining, or losing heat with the air around it. So the adiabatic rates apply to a moving parcel of air. In fact, the word adiabatic means the temperature is changing without a gain or loss of heat. So what that means is the air is expanding and cooling, or the air is being compressed and it's heating. And those are adiabatic rates. There's two. There's the dry adiabatic rate. In fact, as air rises and expands, it's going to expand and cool by 10 Celsius degrees for every thousand meters it goes up. Sinking air is going to heat at 10 Celsius degrees for every thousand meters it goes down. So air, as it rises, it's going to expand and cool by 10 Celsius degrees, no matter what. And sinking air, as it sinks, it's going to get compressed and heat up by 10 Celsius degrees per kilometer, no matter what. However, once the parcel cools to dew point, and here's where we get to tie in the latent heat of condensation, when that parcel cools to dew point, once it cools below dew point, you'll get condensation. As the water vapor condenses, it releases heat. So you have a rising parcel of air that's expanding and cooling by 10 degrees. But once you get to dew point, it starts to release heat, and it's going to release about four calories of heat. So the moist adiabatic rate, once the parcel cools to dew point, once condensation begins, the moist adiabatic rate is 6 degrees of cooling per thousand meters. So moving parcels of air, we have the adiabatic rates. Adiabatic, a change of temperature without 
without a loss or a gain of heat. There's no heat exchanging. The air is rising and it's getting colder, not because the air around it is colder and the air around it is colder, typically with the normal profile of the atmosphere, but the reason the air is getting colder is because it's expanding. That's it. Same thing as air sinks, it's getting warmer, not because the air around it is warmer, even though it probably is. The reason the sinking air is getting warmer is because it's getting compressed because the air pressure is higher as it sinks. And it's going to heat up at 10 degrees per kilometer. Rising air cools through expansion. Sinking air warms through compression. A good way of thinking of that, if you're a diesel mechanic, you're well aware that diesel engines don't have spark plugs. They just compress the fuel and air mixture until it gets so hot that it explodes from the heat of compression. So rising air, a rising air parcel is going to expand and cool by 10 degrees, and a sinking parcel of air is going to get compressed and heat up by 10 degrees. Every kilometer it goes up, cooling by 10. Every kilometer it goes down, it's going to get hotter by 10 degrees. Rising air expands and cools by 10 degrees. The dry adiabatic rate is 10 degrees of cooling for every kilometer it goes up. Once it cools to dew point, you get condensation, which releases heat. So you have cooling by expansion but heating by condensation. So you've got 10 degrees of cooling, four degrees of warming. So the net, the moist adiabatic rate or MAR is six degrees of cooling for every thousand meters you go up. The altitude at which you get condensation, the altitude at which it cools to dew point temperature and clouds form is called the lifting condensation level. Oh, this is why clouds have flat bottoms. So typically clouds are, they're all puffy and bumpy on top, but the bottom is flat. And that's because as the air, the air is relatively well mixed. So the humidity throughout a parcel of air is going to be more or less constant. As that parcel rises, it's going to expand and cool. And so the whole parcel will, will cool at the, at the same altitude. So as it's rising, it cools, it hits condensation temperature at the same altitude, and so the bottom of the clouds are flat, but then as it keeps rising and cooling, it's still condensed, but it keeps rising, so it's bumpy on top because it keeps rising, and as it rises, it gets even colder, so you get even more condensation. So this is an example of a rising parcel of air. Parcel, it's 20 degrees on the ground. The dew point temperature is 10 degrees. So we know it's cooling 10 degrees per kilometer. So at one kilometer, as it goes up, it gets colder, it gets colder, it hits dew point temperature. Once it hits dew point temperature, the relative humidity is 100%. As it cools more than that, you'll get condensation, the release of heat. So once it cools to dew point temperature, it's gonna cool at the moist adiabatic rate, so it cools more slowly. So until you get condensation, it cools by 10 degrees. Once you cool to dew point, it's gonna cool more slowly going to cool by six degrees. And that's going to be very important because as the rate changes, you might realize this six degrees means that the air in the parcel is going to cool more slowly than the environmental lapse rate or the normal lapse rate is 6.4, right? So if the normal lapse rate is 6.4 degrees, that parcel is going to cool six degrees, the air around it cools 6.4. So at the end of another kilometer, our parcel would be 0.4 degrees warmer than the air around it. It's warmer, so it keeps rising. So it's unstable. So the switch in the rate of cooling after condensation is going to be important in making the atmosphere or the parcel unstable. So if the parcel... Yeah. There's competing forces. There's buoyancy, which is making the parcel rise, and gravity, which is trying to pull everything down. If the parcel's cooling more slowly than the air around it, then it'll rise. If the parcel cools more quickly than the air around it, it'll be colder than the air around it. It's a cold air balloon. So the key to is the parcel going to rise or not rise is the rate of cooling of the parcel. Is it cooling at the dry rate or the moist rate? And what's the rate of cooling of the atmosphere around it? So in this example, the environmental lapse rate, somebody sends up a balloon and determines that the environmental lapse rate is 12 degrees of cooling for every kilometer of lifting. Uh, and our parcel, even if it cools at 10 degrees, every kilometer you go up, it's going to cool by 10. The air around it, the environment, is going to cool by 12. 
which really means every kilometer you go up the parcel will get two degrees warmer than the air around it. The atmosphere cools by 12 degrees for every kilometer, so it's going from 25 to 13. I will always give you the ELR, you won't have to guess that. But the parcel is cooling at 10 degrees, so after one kilometer it's cooled by 10 degrees, so the parcel is 15 degrees, the air around it is 13 degrees, so our parcel is 2 degrees warmer, so it keeps rising. It's going to cool by another 10 degrees down to 5. The atmosphere is going to cool by 12 down to 1. So now our parcel is 4 degrees warmer. It's going to rise faster. It's going to cool by another 10 degrees. The atmosphere is going to cool by another 12 degrees. So now our parcel is 6 degrees warmer than the air around it, which means it would rise even faster. So the, in this case, where the DAR is less than the ELR, the parcel is unstable, and the farther it goes up, the warmer it's going to get relative to the air around it. On the other hand, if the ELR, if the atmosphere cools more slowly than the parcel, so again, we have a dry parcel, and by dry, I mean it's below dew point temperature. It's going to cool by 10 degrees. Different day, different place, whatever. The ELR is 5 degrees on this day, so every time you go up through the air, the air around you gets colder by 5 degrees. Every time the parcel goes up by a kilometer, it's going to get colder by 10 degrees. So at one kilometer, it's five degrees colder than the air around it. It's not going to rise. It's a cold air balloon. It's either going to stay there or sink back down. So unstable and stable conditions are determined by the, by the relationship between the DAR or the MAR and the ELR. That is to say... Uh, stable and unstable conditions are caused by the relationship of the environmental lapse rate to the adiabatic rate. If the atmosphere cools off faster, the parcel is warmer and it's unstable. If the atmosphere is cooling more slowly than the parcel, then the parcel is going to be stable and it's not going to rise. So this is an example where we've got the ELR and the ELR looks like it's about eight degrees. So is the parcel, and it looks like the lifting condensation level for this is two kilometers. So as the parcel rises, the parcel's cooling at the dry rate. So it, if the atmosphere is cooling eight and our parcel cooled by 10, it's gonna be four degrees colder, right? So our parcel cooled off by 20 degrees and the atmosphere cooled off by 16 degrees. But now our parcels hit lifting condensation level, so it's cooling at the moist adiabatic rate of six degrees. So now from two up to six kilometers, it's gonna lose 36 degrees. And our, the atmosphere is cooling at a rate of eight degrees. It's gonna lose 48 degrees. So at some point, there's gonna be a crossover, right? The atmosphere is gonna be cooler than the parcel. The parcel is gonna be warmer than the atmosphere, at which point it will become the parcel will be unstable and it'll keep rising. So as long as the parcel's cooler than the air around it, it's stable. Once the parcel's warmer, it's going to become unstable. And in this case, the atmosphere is cooling at a constant rate and the rate of cooling of the parcel changed because it cooled to dew point temperature. And then it started cooling at the moist rate, which was only six degrees per kilometer. Atmospheric stability. Clouds and fog, eh, it's just kind of fun. Although clouds tell you an awful lot about the atmosphere. Definitions, cloud, uh, it's a collection of moisture droplets. Yeah, clouds are made up of liquid water. If you can see the water, it's either liquid or solid. If you can see it, it's ice or it's liquid. If you can't see it, it's a gas. So I put a link down here to the National Weather Service's cloud information page. Fog is just a cloud on the ground. Technically, it's a cloud on the ground with visibility less than a kilometer, but for this class, fog, it's a cloud on the ground. Precipitation is a fancy word for rain and snow. Hail, I guess also liquid or solid water, so ice, snow, rain. Clouds are made up of moisture droplets. And droplets, yeah, here's another weird idea. I keep saying water is weird. Water vapor condenses out onto something. And those something are called cloud condensation nuclei. Kind of like, so 
again, going back to the example of you've got a glass with a drink in it with ice cubes and the water vapor is condensing and making dew on the outside of your glass, the water vapor is condensing on the glass. It's not condensing in the air, making a little fog around your glass, although it certainly could, but usually it just condenses right out on the glass. So the water vapor condenses out onto something. And those somethings in clouds are called cloud condensation nuclei. Those are microscopic particles, uh, soot, dust, ash, smoke from fires, salt spray at the beach. All of those are cloud condensation nuclei in a cubic meter of air. In the room that you're in, there's probably billions of cloud condensation nuclei. So there's usually plenty of cloud condensation nuclei for water to condense out onto. Cloud words. If you speak Latin, it helps. The word cirrus means hair, refers to the wispy appearance of cirrus clouds. Cumulus means heap or pile. Stratus means layer. So cumulus means pile. Stratus means layer. Alto, not the highest. Nimbus means rain, like the Nimbus 2000 broom that, uh, yeah, Nimbus means rain. So Luke Howard in 1830 divided clouds up into 10 categories and, well, 10 types of clouds in four categories. There's the high clouds and the high clouds are easy to spot because they're made of ice crystals and so they look wispy. Mid-level clouds from two to 6,000 meters, they're, they look like clouds. Low clouds from the surface up to 2,000, they just look like clouds. And then puffy clouds, uh, they're puffy and transcend the boundaries. Like they could go from the surface up to 6,000 meters. So it's not in any one altitude category. It's going across a bunch. Great, you're a puffy cloud. Okay, so the high clouds above 6,000 meters, they're made of ice crystals. There's the cirrus, they're wispy. Can tell you that a storm is coming. Cirrus, cirrostratus, cirrocumulus. Cirrostratus is a layer of wispy clouds and cirrocumulus little puffy wispy clouds. They're all high altitude clouds that are all made of ice crystals. So if the sun is behind them, you'll get a halo or a ring. The mid-level clouds, alto cumulus, mid-level puffs, alto stratus, mid-level flat layer. The low clouds, you've got your flat stratus, little puffy clouds, the cumulus, also sometimes called fair weather cumulus. Stratocumulus, it's a layer of puffy clouds, and then nimbostratus, the word nimbo means rain, so a flat layer with rain is nimbostratus. And then there's the vertically developed clouds, cumulonimbus, cumulo literally means pile of rain, so those are the big thunder clouds. Lightning, thunder, wind gusts, updrafts, downdrafts, heavy rain, ice crystals, they're very exciting. So here's the chart out of the book with the 10 cloud types. Let's start with the cirrus, the wispy clouds, cirrostratus, illustrating the halo behind it, and then cirrocumulus, they're puffy. Altocumulus, similar to cirrocumulus, but they look bigger because they're closer to you. Altostratus, it's thicker, it's a darker gray because it's not made of ice crystals. The ice crystal clouds typically have a whiter appearance than the the liquid water clouds, the alto, nimbostratus, stratus, stratocumulus, cumulus, typically are whiter than, I'm sorry, backwards. Those are typically grayer, darker, like the really black clouds are the cumulonimbus because they're so thick because water reflects so much light. Like looking at a cumulonimbus from the outside, it's reflecting all that light. So on the inside, it's really dark. So the darker a cloud is, the thicker it is, the more light it's reflecting. So we've got the high clouds, cirrus, cirrostratus, cirrocumulus, the mid-level, altocumulus, altostratus. Then we've got the low clouds, stratus, it's just a layer. Cumulus, they're little puffs. Stratocumulus, it's a layer of puffs. If there's rain coming out of a layer, it's nimbostratus. If they're little puffy clouds, they're cumulus. And if they say little puffy clouds, the weather is going to be, remain nice. But if they start to develop into larger and larger clouds, then you've got cumulonimbus clouds, which can go from a couple hundred meters off the ground up to six kilometers, if not higher. So cirrus, wispy, altostratus. Uh, it looks darker because it's made of water now. 
Alto cumulus, they're little puffy things. Alto stratus is just boring. Here we've got an alto stratus cloud by Mount Shasta. Stratus, probably the most boring. It's just flat. Nimb at least with nimbo stratus, you get rain, right? Cumulus little puffy clouds seen here over Mono Lake. Cumulonimbus. Cumulonimbus taken from an airplane in flight. So this is probably 20,000 feet. 20,000 feet would be seven kilometers, although it's actually probably closer to 30,000, which would be like 10 kilometers. So the top of this cloud is probably 10 kilometers. And in fact, they flatten out because of the, the this is probably the top of the tropopause. In fact, right here is probably the tropopause. This is the stratosphere. This is the troposphere. So what's happening is this air is rising because it's warmer, but then rem remember, hopefully you remember, at the top of the troposphere, the top of the tropopause, in the bottom of the stratosphere, there's a layer where the temperature doesn't change with altitude. The environmental lapse rate goes to zero. So as the cloud's rising, it's cooling, but the air around it isn't. So the cloud is, it rises till it hits this, I don't want to say it's an inversion layer, but it's exactly the same, that the cloud is now cooling and the air around it isn't. So it starts to spread out horizontally and makes this distinctive anvil shape. The other reason you can get anvil shaped clouds with, with these cumulonimbus is high speed winds that the jet stream will often shear the top of these off. Here's another example, you can, well, I can imagine this rising and then just like it's, you're pouring out paint onto a, onto a sheet of glass, the air is rising and then spreading out when it hits the cold, relatively warmer layer above it. So here we've got, as the air rises, at some point it's gonna freeze, and then you'll have little ice droplets of ice, you'll have hail. And inside there's updraft as the air rises, it expands, it cools, it releases heat, which makes it warmer, which makes it rise. So it pulls in more. So there's a positive feedback loop going on with a cumulonimbus cloud. As the air rises, it pulls in more air, which rises, which pulls in more air. So they get bigger and bigger. As long as they have a fresh supply of warm, moist air, and often there's light winds that move it along like a vacuum cleaner. So it just picks up more and more warm, moist air, and they just get bigger and bigger until they run out of that warm, moist air. As the air is rising, it'll go faster and faster. Uh, updrafts in a mature cumulonimbus cloud have been measured at over 125 miles an hour straight up. In fact, I should track down the YouTube video. There's a fighter pilot whose plane he was flying into a cumulonimbus cloud, his engine quit, he had to bail out, and as he bailed out, he got caught by an updraft. He was knocked unconscious by the hail, the large hailstones in it, and the, the winds. There was lightning, there was thunder. I think he actually came to in the cloud and might have been knocked out again. Anyway, it took him like 15 minutes to get out of the cloud because he kept going up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down, and eventually he fell out of it. The whole point of that is the updrafts in a mature cloud can hit, 100, can hit 125 miles an hour straight up. But then that also means that any rain that's falling or hail that's falling has to fall against that updraft. So that's one of the reasons that hailstones get stuck in this cycle of they'll pick up a layer of water and go up and freeze and go down and pick up another layer of water and freeze until it's heavy enough that it can fall. Thunder and lightning. In order to make a cumulonimbus, you need to have lots of warm, moist air, a very high environmental lapse rate. So the atmosphere has to be cooling off quickly relative to the parcel. So the parcel can get warmer than the air and rise. And light winds to move that whole system along. Otherwise it'll run out of warm, moist air. This one's taken from space. This is actually taken over Africa from the International Space Station, and you can see the air rising and then spreading out as it hits the isothermal layer above it. Often they'll have these bulgy convection towers on top. So again, uh, it, you've got updrafts and downdrafts, very heavy downdrafts. They often cause or can cause plane crashes, microbursts. As the rain's coming down, it makes wind. And so you have a heavy downdraft. That downdraft is gonna sink along the ground and it's gonna make derechos. 
So as the rain falls, it pulls the air with it, which is going to create a gust of wind that travels ahead of the storm. And then that cold wind is also going to help lift up the warm, moist air. This is a picture of what at the time was the largest hailstone in the world, the largest hailstone ever recorded. It weighed uh, 1.75 pounds, almost a two pound hailstone. It had a circumference of about 18 inches. It was sawed in half so that you could see the rings and each of these rings represents a trip up and down through those updrafts. So it's been up and down like one, two, three, four, at least five, well, <laughs> at least five times. It's got big spikes. I think that's crazy. Like I can imagine that hitting your head, hitting my head and just sticking as the spikes penetrate my skull. This is a lenticular cloud. The lenticular cloud is a cloud, but it's the evil opposite of a cumulonimbus cloud. This tells you that the atmosphere is completely stable. What's happening is there's air rising. As it rises, it condenses, but it's colder than the air around it, so it's stable. So it's getting lifted by the mountain. As soon as it's not lifted by the mountain, it sinks. As the air sinks, it gets compressed. It heats up. The relative humidity drops, and the cloud evaporates. So if you were... If you had a drone, if you could make a drone follow a little molecule of water, it's water, 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 getting colder. It's ice. It's ice, it's ice, it's sinking, and now it's back to water vapor. So the cloud tends to stay in one place, but the cloud is just like the region where the condensation is happening. I've got a video, a couple videos of lenticular clouds being formed, and you can see that the cloud, the cloud is just a collection of water molecules, but new ones are coming in and old ones are leaving. It's just the region where the condensation is happening. So lenticular cloud, to make a lenticular cloud, you need to have warm, moist air, a physical barrier, a mountain to lift air up like the Sierras, and you need to have extremely stable conditions, a very low environmental lapse rate, because as that air is rising, it's going to expand and cool and condense, but it's still going to be cooler than the air around it, so it will not rise on its own. And you also need wind to lift the air up. Lenticular cloud, Again, over Shasta. Shasta produces exceptionally beautiful lenticular clouds. Different day, Mount Shasta. And because sometimes they're, they're smaller and they hover over the top of the mountains, they often get called in as UFO sightings because it's a cloud that's saucer-shaped that hovers over a mountain and then disappears later. Virga, it's just a vocabulary word. Virga is when rain falls but it goes through a drier layer of air next to the surface and it evaporates before it hits. It's very common in arid areas, common in Sacramento. Fog. All right. Fog is a cloud on the ground. To make a cloud, you need to have warm, moist air and something to cool it. So you start with warm, moist air and the five kinds are classified based on what's going to cool it. Classified based on what's doing the cooling. So advection fog, evaporation fog, upslope fog, valley fog, and radiation fog are the five types of fog. Advection fog, I did not make these graphics. I just love them because they're so cheesy. You got warm, moist air moving sideways over a colder surface, which cools it, and then you get fog. That's it. San Francisco, Carl, advection fog. You get air moving over cold ocean, which cools it, and you get fog. Evaporation fog, you have the water is warmer than the air. It doesn't mean the water is warm. This is Donner Lake, so the water is probably really cold, but the water is warmer than the air. So as the water evaporates, it hits the cold air and it condenses and it makes fog. This is also, um, this would be like cocoa fog, swim practice, early morning fog, hot tub fog, cup of cocoa fog. All you need to have is the water is warmer than the air above it. So when the water vapor evaporates, when the water evaporates and becomes water vapor, it gets cooled and you get condensation. Up slope fog is just orographic fog. In fact, this is what creates a lenticular cloud. It's what creates orographic precipitation. It's a physical barrier. Their air is mining its own business. It gets blown into a mountain. It gets lifted up. It gets cold. You get a cloud. A cloud on the ground is fog. Upslope fog. 
valley fog, we get in Sacramento because we live in a valley. So what happens is the slopes of the Sierras get cold, the air next to them gets cold, so the cold, dense air flows downhill into the valley where it chills the air that is there, making fog. So you have cold air flowing down into a valley where it mixes with the, the warmer air that was there. It gets cold, you get condensation. Here's valley fog at a really big valley, the Grand Canyon. Here's an Appalachia. You can see the outline of the valley very clearly because of the fog. Here's a good example of valley fog, and on this day the fog is really thick because you can't see the Sierra Buttes. Uh, on days when the layer of fog is thinner, you can see just the top of the Sierra Buttes poking out above the fog. Radiation fog has nothing to do with radioactivity. Radiation fog is called radiation fog because the ground radiates heat. The ground gets cold, which cools the air, so you get fog on the ground made by the cold ground. In order to make radiation fog, the ground needs to be losing a lot of heat to space, so you need a clear night. If it's cloudy, the clouds will radiate the heat back to the ground so you don't get fog. Doesn't occur over water. Not radioactive. Uh, the ground radiates heat on a clear night until the ground gets cold enough to make fog. Radiation fog. California, we're blessed in the Central Valley to have not only radiation fog, but valley fog. And the valley fog is then also enhanced by, for example, all of the rice growing, all of the agriculture pumping out lots and lots of moisture that will then condense and become fog. Precipitation, again, it's water that falls from the sky. So rain, snow, hail, graupel. There's two mechanisms. In a cloud in the tropics, the droplets of water bump into each other until they get large enough to fall as a drop, and that's called collision coalescence. And the other one is the Fergeron, I'm sorry, the Bergeron Finn Dyson process, which occurs in clouds below freezing. So with the collision coalescence, with the collision coalescence mechanism. The droplets just bump into each other to make bigger, bigger droplets. The bigger droplets bump into each other until they make drops that fall. That's it. That's what happens inside tropical clouds, inside clouds where the temperature is above freezing. Once the temperature is below freezing inside the cloud, you'll have droplets of water and ice crystals. And remember, over the ice crystals, the relative humidity is higher. The relative humidity is higher over the ice crystal than it is over the water droplet, even if they're both the same temperature. They could both be zero degrees, but if there's water molecules, they will sublimate out onto the ice crystal. Rather, that's their first choice. If you're a water molecule and you've got ice crystals and water droplets, you're going you're gonna to sublimate onto the ice crystal before you're going to condense out onto the water droplet. So in the atmosphere... It's very chaotic that you've got water droplets that are evaporating and condensing and melting and freezing. So water in the atmosphere is going back and forth between the four states or the two states, three states, solid, liquid, gas, solid, liquid, gas, going back and forth. But it's like if you were going to Las Vegas and you were gambling in a casino that was crooked, if they had loaded dice, every time you'd lose just a little bit and eventually you'd end up losing everything, right? Because every time you roll the dice the odds are in the dealer's favor. Well, if you've got all these molecules of water, the odds are it's going to sublimate out onto the ice crystal. So the story of the bergeron Dyson process is, I just wanted to bring this up and show again, the relative humidity over water, relative humidity over ice. So you're going to get sublimation over ice before you get condensation over water. This is a hole punch cloud. They're also called fall streak clouds. And they are an example of the bergeron Dyson ice crystal precipitation mechanism in action. So what's happening here, and I'll relate this to Bergeron's story. So Bergeron in the early 1900s was uh, in the, at the Bergen School of Meteorology in Norway, along with what were the greatest meteorologists of the 20th century or possibly any time. Carl Gustav Rossby, uh, Jakob and Wilhelm Bjorknes, 
Bergeron, they're all there doing meteorology. And they understood why it rained in tropical clouds, but they didn't understand why it rained in mid-latitude or higher latitude clouds. They knew that the temperature in the cloud was cold enough, so there had to be ice crystals, so the collision coalescence mechanism didn't explain what was going on. So they knew that the relative humidity over ice was higher than the relative humidity over water, but they still couldn't figure it out. Bergeron decides to go for a walk in the woods, and the temperature is right around freezing, and there's fog. He's walking through a pine forest in the fog on a freezing day, because it's Norway, so it's always freezing in the winter. And as he's walking along, the temperature continues to drop, and he realizes that the fog starts to clear, and at the same time the fog is clearing, frost, frost crystals are forming on the pine needles. And he realizes that what's happening is the uh, water molecules off the ice are sublimating and depositing, water molecules off the water droplets are evaporating and condensing, but because the relative humidity is higher over ice, odds are if something is going to condense or sublimate, it's going to do it onto the ice crystal, not onto the water droplet. He had that, and that was his aha moment, was he saw the fog clearing at the same time frost was growing on the needles. So what we have here is some sort of alto, probably alto stratus cloud, and it's at an altitude right about freezing. In fact, might just be a little below freezing. You could have, and it's got super cooled water droplets. You can have water below freezing as a liquid until something happens and then it freezes. It's Water's, yeah, water's absolutely fascinating. You can experience this on a cold day in the woods, and I've, I've actually done it myself. You can have supercooled puddles, and the molecules are liquid, and because they're liquid, the molecules are sliding all over each other, but they're cold enough that they should be frozen, and when water freezes, it gets locked into this hexagonal shape that makes it expand, and so it's kind of like if you had a box of Legos, and they're all jumbled together. And if you just shook it long enough, if they would all organize themselves and stack very neatly, the same thing happens with water molecules. So you could have a puddle of super cooled water. And if you touch it, it jiggles the molecules and they all snap together and you'll watch the puddle freeze before your very eyes. It, it, it's just amazing. So in this cloud, you've got water droplets super cooled water droplets and the water is evaporating and condensing and these are ice crystals so the ice crystals the molecules are sublimating and depositing but what's happening is these water droplets are evaporating some of them are condensing but more of them are sublimating onto these ice crystals that are falling from the sky so as the water droplets evaporate they sublimate onto the ice crystals and then this hole will get bigger as the crystals continue to fall from the sky a hole punch cloud. You'll see them. Uh, often airplanes will make them as they go up through. The airplanes will add a little bit of water vapor that'll then become ice crystals. Uh, so often you'll see hole punch clouds. You'll see them in Sacramento now if you keep your eyes on the skies. Snowflakes form in freezing clouds and Based on the temperature, the temperature and the humidity, you can have plates or snowflakes or plates or columns or prisms or needles. And each of these is going to refract light differently. Like the solid plates can refract light at a 22 degree angle or a 44 degree angle, depending on how the light comes in. And that's going to be the physical basis for making halos. So this is a 22 degree halo. These are some sort of cirrus cloud. They're made of ice crystals and they are refracting the light into this halo at an angle of 22 degrees away from the light coming in from the sun. This is an extraordinarily complex set of halos and arcs. These are sun dogs, the two little bright spots on either side of the sun, sun dogs. You can see those in Sacramento. I think the next shot this is just a diagram showing what the different names, circumzenithal arc, supralateral upper, I'm not going to ask you about any of this stuff, except you need to know that high altitude clouds are ice crystal clouds. And so because they're made of ice, you can get this refraction and this halo effect. I think this is in Antarctica. They have lots of ice crystals in the air in Antarctica because it's so cold, showing two sun dogs. 
more Virga. And that's it for Clouds and Fog. So that's the end of the part one of chapter four on weather. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, I hope you look forward to the second part, which will talk about why it actually rains and how we have hurricanes and tornadoes and lightning and thunder. Anyway, good stuff. <laughs>